Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn with me, please, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Galatians once more. We're in chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 12 down to verse 20. Uh, perhaps we'll proceed further than that, but at least for our reading purposes, beginning in verse 12. And this is Paul's appeal, having uh, talked about uh, adoption and then expressed his anxiety uh, about uh, how uh, they have turned away so quickly. Uh, now he makes an appeal to them. And so beginning in verse 12, he says, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in the flesh, ye despise not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that they might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. Having described to them uh, the marvelous position uh, that uh, they had enjoyed uh, as sons and heirs uh, in verses 1 through 7, and the wonderful truth of biblical adoption, uh, then, as we said, he talks about his concern, his deep anxiety, how uh, that they had... Uh, in a sense, made a second turn. Initially, they turned to God from idols. They would entered into this tremendous position. And now, because of false teaching, they were tempted to turn again uh, to the weak and beggarly elements, uh, going putting themselves back under Mosaic law. And so he is, expresses his anxiety. He's afraid that he'd labored in vain, uh, that uh, all that labor that he had done amongst them uh, would be lost because of the false teachers. And so now, as he makes an appeal to them, and it's a very passionate appeal, uh, and uh, the appeal is all, is concerning a, ch a change of attitude. And, and the change of attitude wasn't on his part. He had not changed in his attitude towards them at all, but they had changed in their attitude towards him. And he's going to describe what their initial response to him was, and then how that had changed and how false teaching had brought about their changing attitude towards uh, the Apostle Paul. And so initially, uh, he, as he says, uh, he calls them brethren. Uh, of course, he uh, distinguishes, makes no distinction here between Jew or Gentile. He just calls them brethren, uh, making no distinction. But he says, be as I am. And what he's saying is, I wish you would take the same ground that I'm standing on. Instead of going with these legalists, I wish you were like me. And what does he mean by that? Well, uh, he says, uh, Paul the Jew had been justified by faith alone without the works of the law. He was justified completely apart from Jewish ritual and ceremony. And he longed for them to be like him in his Christian life and delivered from these false teachers who were wanting to put them back under these uh, Jewish uh, rituals and ceremonies. And so I wish you were like me. I wish you were enjoying the liberty that is yours in Christ. I wish you were enjoying the freedom that you, you should be enjoying, but these people are causing you to doubt and causing you to, to turn back to this weak and beggarly system. So he says, I wish that you were like this. He longed for them to become like him to enjoy that liberty where Christ has made us free. And he had become like them uh, in non-observance of legal 
uh, ritual. Uh, so, for instance, he, again, going back to our verse, he says, uh, be as I am, for I am as ye are. And, of course, they were once Gentiles. They had no connection with legalism, with ceremony, and all the rest of it. And so he, in a sense, became like them, ignoring the all those rituals and ceremonies, and he wants them to be like he is now, justified by faith without any of those other things, instead of being tempted to go back to that old system. And then he says, uh, you have not injured me at all. And so now he's referring to his visit to Galatia. He's, he's reminding them of how they first responded to him. And it's very evident that Paul had some kind of illness. We're going to think a lot about this. And the illness uh, produced uh, it, some kind of uh, aspects of his features uh, to cause disgust. Uh, how, whatever it looked like, uh, it produced a loathing or disgust normally in those that saw it and would mean the rejection of the unfortunate sufferer. And so he, notice what he says. He says here, um, you know that through infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first. And so he's talking about his condition, uh, this infirmity of the flesh. He, he talks elsewhere, doesn't he, about this thorn in the flesh that he prayed about for deliverance. And the Lord uh, says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, we don't really know what this is, but we can we can get some clues as we look at it. But just for now, I want you to notice in, in verse 14, he says, My temptation which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor reject it. And so I want to just focus on this these phrases, despise not, nor reject it. Um, the normal condition that he had would cause people to respond in this way, to reject the person and despise the person that had these features. Uh, despise means to treat with contempt. Uh, the, to, to despise utterly is the language. Reject has the idea of loathing, uh, to spit out. <laughs> and so um, what he's saying is this, although my disease repelled you, you did not on that account refuse to hear my message. They did not judge the messenger or reject the message because of outward appearance. So it's very evident when Paul went there, he didn't look like uh, some of these uh, kind of finely groomed TV preachers that we see. <laughs> uh, there, there was obviously something caused by this disease that caused him to look repulsive. And nevertheless, despite that, they, they did not judge the messenger uh, by his appearance and reject the message, but they responded to it. And so clearly Paul's physical condition was such to make them want to turn away in disgust. Yet he was so absorbed in his message, so taken up with Christ, uh, the treasure was so shining through this earthen vessel that the excellency and exceeding greatness of the power was seen to be of God. And so, again, it wasn't what he looked like. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, you read some of the great preachers in the history of the church. Uh, they talked about uh, men like D.L. Moody, who didn't appear to have a neck. His head just seemed to be stuck on the top of his, his torso. Uh, you, you see how Spurgeon was a very portly individual and was kind of lampooned in the press. Uh, one of the great preachers was uh, Christmas Evans, a one-eyed preacher, and uh, he had a, a, a false eye, and uh, it seemed like wherever you were in the congregation, that eye seemed to follow you. That's what the people said. But not, in other words, none of these were a kind of, uh, we might say, Joel Osteen-type individuals. You know, they didn't look with that fresh-groomed look, uh, all the rest of it. And yet God used them tremendously. And so we've got to recognize that it, what God uses is not our appearance, it's the message that is brought that is important. And so Paul declared the glorious message of the gospel. They received him, and notice how they received him. Despite how he looked, they, it says, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. 
Now, that's quite a reception, isn't it? <laughs> as if he was a visiting angel from heaven or as if it was the Lord himself that was amongst them. And so what a tremendous way they responded. This was their initial response to Paul, uh, despite what he looked like. And so um, Paul declared the glorious message of the gospel. They received him as a message of messenger from another world and accorded him a welcome worthy of the Lord himself. And notice verse 15. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if you had if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them unto me. Now this reference to his eyes has led to a lot of speculation that this could have been what was going on. There must have been something about his eyes. In fact, uh, what corrobor corroborates with that is in chapter 6, in verse 11, he talks about, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. And so it seems that perhaps there was some kind of disease of the eyes is, is what people speculate. Now, let me just say this. It's difficult enough to diagnose the case of a living patient today. <laughs> uh, that should warn us about the futility of attempting it for a person who's been dead over 1900 years. <laughs> you get the idea? So we're just speculating. We don't really know what it was. What we do know is that normally, whatever this condition was, it caused the people to be repulsed at it. Uh, and yet they received him in a marvelous way. And so he he certainly in those early days of spiritual prosperity, he, he says they would have gladly plucked out their eyes and given them to him. The fellowship was so deep and intimate that no sacrifice would have been too great for them to make for him. In other words, their initial response was, despite what he looked like, the message that he brought, the passion with which he brought it, caused them to love this man and to be willing to do anything, as it were, to um, uh, to encourage him in his labors, even if it meant plucking out their own eyes. Something changed, though. Where is this then this blessedness you spake of? Where's it all gone? What's caused the change? Notice verse 16, the cur their current attitude to Paul is seen in verses 16 through 18. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That interesting. By the way, it's just an, easy to see the fickleness of the human heart in examples like this. When the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem, remember them, you know, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And within a week, the same mob is crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And we so often can see this, the, the, the human nature can turn just like that uh, from loving somebody, being willing to do anything for them, and the next minute becoming their enemy. And what's caused this change? Well, he's telling them the truth. They don't like it. What has brought about all this change? Can you see the wreckage caused by false teaching? This false teaching has come in and it has brought a massive change even in their attitude to the Apostle Paul. A man they once loved, a man they once appreciated, treated him like he was a lord himself amongst them. And now there's a complete change. And what we can say is false teaching, it ruins form of blessing. Where is the blessedness you once spoke of? Right? It's, it's robbing them of that blessing they once enjoyed. Ill spiritual enthusiasm. Their enthusiasm, willing to pluck out their own eyes, and now they see him as an enemy. Uh, so, And it creates resentment on the grounds of the truth. Often, a preacher can be resented when he brings God's word to bear on people's corporate and individual lives. And people can... Well, they can want to shoot the messenger <laughs> uh, because they don't like the message. And that's what we see here. That there's, been a, there's been a complete change, and it's only brought about by these false teachers. Prior to that, they, they loved Paul, but now because of false teaching, there's a complete shift 
And it's so easy to see. I've, I've seen it so many times. People get involved in wrong teaching and, and their whole attitude changes, even towards people who have invested heavily in them in the past. And they turn around and treat them like dirt uh, because they've imbibed this false teaching. Verse 17, it says, they zealously affect you, but not well. False teaching brings division. It tells us they would exclude you. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yeah, they would exclude you, that they might affect them. And so it always brings division. Uh, the false teachers uh, don't want anything to do with faithful men and women of God. Uh, they want to isolate God's people from them. Uh, they uh, And so... Uh, the false teacher have zeal. We see this. They zealously affect you. Uh, verse 18, again, it says, but it's good to be zealously affected in a good thing, but they were zealously affected in a wrong thing. And by the way, it's a constant challenge to us, isn't it? The zeal of false teachers. It's a constant challenge to those of us that have the truth. Uh, misplaced zeal, great zeal, like the Pharisees, they would cross, the Lord says, they would cross land and sea to make one convert to their legalistic, weak and beggarly system. Isn't that amazing? And you see the cults today, you see their zeal. Yeah, it's, I mean, and they don't have a message even. I mean, compared to what we have, they really have no message. And, and yet their, their, their zeal with which they go about their labors is a challenge to all of us. And so, again, we said zeal is a good thing. In fact, <laughs> what a tragedy that zeal means hot. <laughs> you know, that's the, the language. It's like the red face. That's the meaning of the word zeal. And we should have zeal for the gospel. We should have zeal for the truth of God. We should have zeal for, for the truth of the assembly. We should be people with zeal. And, and yet so often, uh, where the, true, the people who have the truth are comfortable with the truth and well the lord's accusation about lukewarmness to the laodicean church on the other hand false teachers continue with zeal unabated and those of us that have the truth can be so lukewarm and insipid and 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 so what a tragedy and so he says it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing Zeal is is a good thing. It's I mean, people get so zealous about things that have no consequence whatsoever, and yet we're talking about eternal realities. We should challenge our hearts. Where is my zeal for the Lord? It's good to have zeal and a good thing, but these people, these false teachers, they certainly have zeal, and they zealously affect you, but not well, not in a good way. And it's interesting, isn't it, when you see false teaching— and you see people's personalities change, and you see not for the better. There's a pride, there's an arrogance that that, that characterizes them. Their whole personalities change, and so you can see the zeal of those that are trying to do this, but the results of it are not good at all. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that they like to do is they like to use excluding you, right? In other words, um, if you don't join us, if you don't, we're gonna we're gonna kind of give you a a wide berth. We're going to ignore you. So they they tend to use uh, this idea of cutting people off. Initially, what they tend to do, and it's funny with the cults, they'll begin. They they call it the love bomb approach. <laughs> kind of interesting, the love bomb approach. And so they get somebody who is interested, and they just pour lots of love into them and kind of practical care. Uh, I know, for instance, Mormons, you know, they, uh, people that they visit, they'll, they, they'll do all kinds of things for them. We'll call it a love bomb. They just really want to. And then once they've got them, then if they begin to have doubts, <laughs> begin to pull away, then they use exclusion techniques, right? So we, we just want to be aware of how these, we don't want to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. And these are some of the things he does. And so it says, they 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 um that they 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 would exclude you that ye might affect them and so the idea is they want to cut them off basically exclude them and um <clears throat> kind of what a tragedy that people would cross land and sea to sign somebody up 
to their weak and beggarly systems, whereas we sometimes would hardly cross the street to give somebody the truth, the liberating, glorious truth of the gospel of the grace of God. So he says in verse 18 that this defection seems to have occurred in Paul's absence. So it's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. And so obviously when Paul was there with them, they were responding marvelously to him, but now he's gone. You see, and so often uh, this can occur. There's kind of a vacuum when good spiritual leadership leaves the scene. There's a vacuum and uh, becomes a breeding ground for error. After good spiritual leadership, I just finished reading through the book of Judges. I know we did that together, but it's just kind of interesting if you read back in Judges 2, that once good spiritual leadership um, vacates, uh, then it seems the enemy comes in very quickly. And so we'll notice, uh, I just want to read a few verses from Joshua, uh, from Judges chapter 2. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. See, there was good leadership there. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Geash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. So often these false teachers can come in with their error when there's a spiritual vacuum, when maybe leadership have transitioned or whatever, and uh, godly people have passed off the scene, Paul's out of town, uh, he's left them, he's moved on to somewhere else, and now in this vacuum, this is where the false teachers have come in, this is where all this change has occurred. So Paul says in verse um verse uh, 19 and 20, we're going to see a change of voice. We, we saw a change of attitude, first of all, in them, going from this great enthusiasm towards Paul and his ministry to seeing him as an enemy. And now we want to see a change of his voice. And notice it says, particularly verse 19, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. I stand in doubt of you. So a change of voice in Paul's part. The change of attitude was on their part, change of voice on Paul's part. So he begins this way. He says, my little children. Again, notice the tenderness that he addresses them. My little children. And then he says, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So uh, they he calls them my little children because in a very real sense, he was their spiritual father and they were his children in the faith. And so that's why he calls them my little children. They were his for he had brought them to Christ. He had brought them to birth. Uh, he was the one under God who had shared the gospel message with them and seen them come to faith in Christ. And so he's deeply moved. Uh, his emotions are rising. Uh, he, his expression now goes beyond brethren. He calls them my little children. They were his own children, his own dear children. And he now sees them in a very real danger. And so he says he is travailing in birth, pangs. And notice he says, I travail in birth again. So in other words, there had been a previous travailing, and that was to see them saved. He'd been travailing in gospel labors and, and of course, travailing like a woman you know, in the process of giving birth. There's a lot of a lot of effort goes into that. A lot of agony goes into that. And that there'd, there'd obviously been a lot of labor and agony that had gone in to uh, bringing them to Christ. But now there's, there's a new agony. Uh, there's a new travailing. And what is this new travailing? He says, whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. 
And so that's his goal. To, not just to see them saved. That's just the beginning, right? That's the beginning of the work. The, the, the ultimate aim is to see them like the Lord Jesus, to see them Christ-like. And the tragedy is that when he first came, he, he was there to set them free from idolatry and bring them into a living relationship with Christ. Now, and that was the agony of the evangelist, if you like, that was the agony of the evangelist, to see them delivered from idolatry, brought into a living relationship with the living God through the work of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. But now it's the agony of the pastor teacher, of the shepherd. He, he wants to see them like Christ, and, and he wants to set them free a second time now from law-keeping which is not going to help them to become Christ-like. It can't form Christ in you, law-keeping. And so his ardent desire was to see Christ formed in their lives. Again, we need to recognize that seeing people come to Christ, there needs to be some agonizing, agonizing in prayer, <laughs> agonizing in earnestness, in speaking the gospel message, and then in seeing people come to that place where they're Christ-like, they're agonizing over people who are uh, being led astray with wrong teaching and, and the teacher's agony of them being deceived and pre play, pleading with them to turn uh, from these things. And so, again, what we need to recognize is that this is a very serious thing, isn't it? Souls are so precious to the Lord. And so seeing them saved, seeing them like Christ, these are these are things that require certainly great effort, just like travailing in birth. That's the language he uses. He says in verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So he has a great desire to be with them and properly assess the situation accurately. And then he could adjust his speech to their situation. He could be more tender if the situation demanded it or more stern if necessary. He's obviously saying to us that he preferred to speak to them than to write to them. And it is true, isn't it? It's hard sometimes in writing to convey what's going on in the heart through the voice. And so when you're speaking, in some ways, it's easier. Uh, the tenderness can come through uh, through the way we sp we speak, we address things, or maybe even sternness if that's needed. Uh, it can be so easily conveyed through the inflection of the voice. And so he obviously preferred that than writing. Uh, and of course, we, sometimes we, it's good to write to people a note of encouragement, but it's always second best. <laughs> it's better if you can speak to them in person. And I, I people who uh, they don't like to text me or email me, they like to speak to me. <laughs> they just prefer, uh, and the, if it's using the telephone or whatever, but they just think it's better. And I think there's something to it. The voice is more effective than the pen. And certainly uh, Paul saw that, and he he certainly uh, was perplexed to them. Uh, he, he, he was perplexed. He, he wanted to get a better assessment, get there amongst them. And he says, then I change my voice if needed because I stand perplexed. I'm, I'm perplexed by you. Uh, he really was. He's perplexed as to them. I stand in doubt of you. Where are you? He's kind of wanting to get a true assessment of their condition. Now, we did say we'd make progress beyond verse 20 and here we are we're going to look at this next section from verse 21 to 31 which is an allegory now it's not very common in scripture to have allegories typology is common but allegory is something different and this allegory that he's going to use is going to show the difference between bondage and liberty he's going to use this allegory to illustrate the difference. He wants them to stay and enjoy liberty rather than to be kind of snared into bondage. And so he's going to use this allegory to do it. And once more, he's dealing with Abraham. It's amazing how many times Abraham has come up in this epistle. And so he wants to consider Abraham again, the father of the faithful, but this time to illustrate from an event in his life the relationship between law and promise. And so as we look at this allegory together, there are things we need to look out for. We're going to see a lot of twos here. 
we're going to see two mothers and two sons and two cities and two covenants. Okay? And keep all that straight in our minds. Two mothers, two sons, two cities, two covenants. This is what he's going to use to illustrate uh, the difference between law and promise, bondage and liberty. And so in verse 21, he says, Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Now, again, interesting, isn't it? The, the, you that desire to be under the law, this this teaching is having an influence on them, and they, it's appealing to them. They want to put themselves back under the law. And so he says to them, you that want to do this, you're not listening to the law. You're not listening to what God says. And, of course, he's going to use uh, this incident uh, from the book of Genesis. But I just want to illustrate a point here, which I think is really important. If you look at Romans chapter 15, just for one second. And it always amazes me that primarily uh, Paul writes to Gentile churches, but he constantly assumes an understanding of the Old Testament. And he uses the Old Testament in his teaching consistently. So Romans 15 verse 4 it says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And, you know, it's kind of interesting how there are people that, that don't want to deal with the Old Testament. They don't like the Old Testament. And yet Paul, primarily writing to Gentiles, constantly refers to the Old Testament, assumes a knowledge, presumably in his teaching. He used Old Testament teaching uh, very frequently. So even right into the Corinthians, people carried away to dumb idols. The Galatians carried away to idols too. And yet he assumes they understand in, in Corinth, they understand Passover, they understand unleavened bread, they understand first fruits. They under, so he, he, clearly he taught the Feast of Jehovah in Corinth to Gentiles. Because he assumes they they know all about those festivals and how they're applied. Isn't that interesting? And uh, uh, he goes the wilderness wanderings in in First Corinthians ten. He talks about all the incidents in the wilderness wandering as warnings to them. Don't you be like them? And so uh, we we need to not shy away. Is my point from using the Old Testament teaching truth? Uh, there are some people that all they want is New Testament. Or oh, they don't like the Old Testament at all. You can't understand the New Testament without a proper grasp of the Old Testament. And so we, we're going to see here that he's just assuming they understand this. They get this story. They know what he's saying. And so he says, <clears throat> first of all, and again, we just need to understand this. He says, um, you that desire to be under the law, verse 21, do you not hear the law? And what he's telling us is the law that he's referring to. And again, it's the Pentateuch here he's referring to. It's not, you know, the, the book of Genesis is really what he's going to be using. And so what he's telling us is this. God's word is God's voice to us. It really is, isn't it? God's word, God speaks to us through his word. And so he says, are you not hearing the law? Are you not paying attention to what the law is saying to us? And, and so uh, he points them in a different direction from the one they were heading using the Old Testament scriptures to point them away from this direction into a better direction. And so he says in verse 22, for it is written. And again, so amazing how many times Paul says this, amazing how many times the Lord says, have you not read <laughs> you know, when he's speaking to his enemies, to, to the, the legal men of his day, he keeps, did you not read? <laughs> And that's always the best way to answer, isn't it? Have you not read what the scripture says? Have you not considered the word of God? Are you not listening to God's word? And so he says, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So here's the two women. Agar, of course, we know is the bondwoman. And Sarah, we know, is the free woman. Now, it's kind of interesting that as we consider these women, Sarah was chronologically first, 
but her promised son second. Hagar was chronologically second, but her son was first. Okay, remember the story? Ishmael represents the fruits of nature. In other words, it was a natural thing. Isaac is the fruit of God's promise and is supernatural. Okay, so natural versus supernatural. Uh, one, the use of really man's schemes and plans. The other one is the fruit of God's promise. The important point here in this particular verse really is simply this, that um, it's not so much the physical descent that's involved here, but the different mothers. He wants to just kind of get our attention on the two different mother mothers, the bond made and the free woman. Verse 23, it says, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. So after the flesh, purely the fruit of nature. Like the law, it demanded human power for fulfillment. Right? Just like Moses' law, why? what's the problem? It's weak through the flesh. It, it requires human, uh, all that God has said we'll do. They have to comply. They have to continue in all things that are written. So it's all dependent on human power. And so purely the fruit of nature, like the law, demanding human power fulfillment, Ishmael was born as a result of human scheming. <laughs> and by the way, isn't it interesting how a lot of human schemes in Scripture backfire? In fact, I'd say most of them. Beware scheming, right? Isn't it, it, it? We can make things happen, but it might not be of God at all if it's all human manipulation and scheming. I mean, this is what's going on here. It's, it's referring to uh, Genesis 16. In fact, maybe it would be good for us just to read Genesis 16 just for a moment and then verses 1 through 5 to get the story that Paul is using as a basis to teach here, Genesis 16, it says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. By the way, I wonder where they got Hagar from. <laughs> well, I think it was when Abraham went down to Egypt for help, uh, rather than staying where he was in the land that God had promised him. And, of course, they picked up Egyptian there. Uh, also, Lot got a taste for city life and uh, the well-watered plains, right? I mean, lots of implications. When people are out of the will of God, it's amazing what seeds can be sown that later result in a harvest that's not healthy. And so here's the Egyptian. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Wasn't good advice on this occasion, was it? Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, gave her to her husband Abraham to be his wife, and he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. It seems to be a successful mission here. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Sarai said to Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. When she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord's judge between me and thee. And so all we can say, kind of simply here as we, we look at this, Part of the human scheming is connected with impatience on waiting upon the Lord, right? He had promised that he was going to give a son and an heir to Abraham, but it wasn't happening fast enough. And so because of that, often our impatience can lead us to scheming instead of trusting well, this is not happening quick enough. <laughs> I can make this work. Let me just try a few tweaks and see how it goes. And of course, it never really works out well. And we see that here quite clearly. So notice again, back in our passage in verse 23, 
we notice it says that the free woman's child was by promise. And so it says, he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. And so this promise of God required his power for fulfillment. Because remember, she's barren, and so can't depend on her. <laughs> and so it, it was supernatural. It was a supernatural birth. The promise of God required his power completely for fulfillment. In fact, down in verse 29, he says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Isn't that interesting? And so the promise of God required his power for fulfillment. So the lessons of the allegory, having stated the historical background from verse 24 onwards, he's going to give us the lessons. He says, which things are an allegory? Now, it's not that they didn't really happen. Right? The, the allegory doesn't take away from the literal meaning of the passage. The events we just read in Genesis 16 really took place. <laughs> okay, But he's drawing lessons from them. So it's probably good to kind of understand what do we mean by an allegory. And it means to speak not according to the primary sense of the word. This is according to W.E. Vine. Not according to the primary sense of the word, but to, so that the facts stated are applied to illustrate principles. We're looking at the facts stated and we're using them to illustrate principles. That's what an allegory is. And so doesn't deny the literal the literal events taking place, but he's just drawing lessons from it to illustrate principles. So verse 24, which things are an allegory, but these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So the two women, Hagar and Sarah, Sarah represent two covenants, the old covenant, Mount Sinai and the new covenant, right? So really, this is the big lesson. These two women represent two covenants. Hagar represents Mount Sinai, where the law was given, and it gendereth to bondage. Bondage, In other words, it begets children to slavery. The law enslaves. <laughs> it's an enslaving thing. Uh, it puts us under bondage, and so it genders to bondage. It begets children to slavery. And so, and he says, Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Verse 25, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now, this is a marvelous piece of, of clever extension on part of Paul. What he says is, he extends it to Jerusalem. So Mount Sinai in Arabia answers to Jerusalem, which now is. And of course, the thought is this, that where is this false teaching coming from? Who, who's bringing this teaching to Galatia and where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from Jerusalem, aren't they? <laughs> Men from Jerusalem came and said, unless you be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. So it's the source. It's the source of it. And so he's getting right to the source. Jerusalem was the home of Judaism. It was from there that the principle of law keeping was being sent forth. That circumcision and the observance of the legal code was necessary to be saved. Both Jew and Gentile were to subscribe to it, although it all sprang from a wrong source and from the wrong mother. <laughs> Remember the connection here? That's Hagar. <laughs> which is Mount Sinai, which is Jerusalem, which now is. Coming from the wrong source, from the wrong mother. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Sarah represents the new covenant, or covenant of promise. Jerusalem above is a system of grace, for the true gospel comes from heaven itself from God, 
God sending forth his son out of heaven. God sending forth his spirit out of heaven. It's all coming from there, from heaven. That's where it comes from. And so uh, it, it, since it's not subject to legal ordinances, it's the mother of all Christians. We're born from above. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our destiny is heaven, right? We're a heavenly people. We're connected with heaven. Oh, how good it is to remind ourselves constantly of this. We're not of the earth, <laughs> earthy. We're, we're connected with the risen man, uh, the Lord from heaven. That's our connection. So he says um, in verse uh, 27, he says, For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that transtravailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And this is a quotation from Isaiah 54, verse 1. Of course, uh, maybe we should just go there just to verify this. Isaiah 54, verse 1. By the way, the Apostle Paul absolutely loved the prophet Isaiah. And he quotes frequently from Isaiah's prophecy. So it says here, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing. Cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. And of course, uh, although it's not directly related to, to Sarah and Hagar and the whole story here, but he's using that to just talk about the rejoicing here to link the pre with the previous verses sarah was the barren and desolate one who cried for children hagar the woman who had a husband but in due time the position was reversed and so although the law had been prominent in the past grace had now come into prominence and was and a vast multitude was saved through the gospel would far exceed those who were under the law. Now think about that. How many people are saved by grace? Oh, a vast multitude, right? From every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Much more than those that are connected with the law. Praise God for that. And so... What he's saying is the law had been prominent in the past. Grace had now come into prominence. And a vast multitude saved through the gospel would far exceed those under the law. So what's the application of this allegory? He says, verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We are not the children of the bondwoman, not under the covenant of the law, not connected with Jerusalem that now is, that is in bondage with our children. Instead, we're children of promise, the product of a miraculous birth from heaven, born from above. Now, it's interesting that Ishmael is not mentioned in this verse. He's like the law. He's set aside. <laughs> He's not part of the picture. No, we're not connected with Ishmael, not connected with law, but instead, we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Every one of us are the product of a supernatural birth from above, uh, entirely apart from the law. In verse 29, but as them, then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Now, let's look again. Where's this coming from? Genesis 21. Again, yet another reference to this story. Taking it a little step further, Genesis 21 and verse 9. We read this. It says, And Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. <laughs> And so she says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, and so on and so forth. So this is what's being referred to here. Isaac was weaned. That means he was making progress. Then the mockery came. And the persecution always and uh, has and always has come from those who follow the weak and beggarly elements, men of the flesh, 
detest men of the spirit. No one despises grace more than the man who is trying to save himself by his own merit. Do we see that today? Who are the most persecuted group on the earth right now? It's Christians all around the world. And who is doing the persecute? Usually religious people who are based on a work system. And that's always been the case. And so those <clears throat> uh, that are born after the flesh persecute him that was born after the spirit. So it has always been the case. Those people despise grace that are trying to save themselves. Verse 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. It reminds us, doesn't it, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, purge out the old woman, or the old leaven, sorry. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Be done with them. Get rid of them. You don't want to be any part with that. We're done with that thing. Uh, we're, we're the children of miraculous birth. Uh, we don't want to be connected with that at all. And so it says, For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. He sums up, really, the meaning of the allegory. And it's a beautiful summary, really. We are not connected with Hagar, with Sinai, with bondage, that's not for us. We're connected with Jerusalem, which is above. In other words, the, the gospel which came down from heaven <laughs> that brought us into this new covenant relationship, which is based entirely on grace. This is our position. We, like Isaac, are miraculous births. <laughs> our new birth was just as miraculous as Isaac's birth <laughs> and this is where we are we're children of the free not of the slave not of the bondwoman and so that nicely brings us to a conclusion of chapter four and i trust the lord will in help us to enjoy the liberty that we have in christ jesus and not be engendered again to bondage <laughs>